Today, we're kicking off a new teaching series titled Jacob. I want to invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 27 with me. If you need a Bible, we have some Bibles, some printed copies of God's Word in, in, in the back here. Love for you to take one, own it, read it. If you're rather have a digital, follow along digitally, you can scan the seat back in front of you or click that link that's in the comment section if you're online with us. But Genesis chapter 27 is where we're going to be. As you're finding Genesis chapter 27, Genesis, the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, is divided into eight different sections. The first four sections are the first four major events, and that's a span of some 2,000 years, and it's Genesis chapter 1 to chapter 11. The first major event, of course, is the creation account. That's the beginning, the the second is the fall of man. The third is the flood. And the fourth, the fourth is the tower of Babel. That's when mankind was scattered throughout the earth. The, the latter four sections is Genesis chapter 12 through Genesis chapter 50. And it's a span of, get this, 300 years, 300 years. And it's, it's divided uh, into four major characters. We have looked at the life of Abraham. We've looked at the life of Isaac. Today, we're going to begin to look at the life of Jacob. And then the fourth and final section of Genesis is Joseph. It's Joseph. And so today, though, we're kicking off this teaching series titled Jacob. Now, there are 10 generations from Adam to Noah. And then there are 10 generations from Noah to Abraham. And what we have seen, if you've been with us through this study across Genesis, what we have seen is the brokenness of humanity beginning in the garden, and it has continued. And out of the result of that brokenness, we have seen a dysfunctional family after dysfunctional family after dysfunctional family. And today we continue to see Isaac's dysfunctional family. Now, within the dysfunctional family, there's, there's always distrust. There's always distrust. There's, there's always a level of deceit within the dysfunctional family. I don't know about you. Maybe you are the one family on this earth that doesn't have a touch of dysfunction. But I, I, I've met every family. Uh, uh, every family I've met, rather, has a touch of dysfunction. You, you know what I mean? Now, I know it's September. Uh, but my house was decorated for the fall in, I think it was July. And uh, that's just my, that's my bride. And, uh, and I just go with it. And so... I did feel a touch of fall in the air this morning. I don't know about you. There was a hint for three minutes. It was, it was wonderful. But Thanksgiving is just around the corner. That's where I'm getting after. And some of you are already thinking, do I invite a person? And you know that person. And you know you should invite the person, but you're really struggling to invite that person right now. Why? Because they bring a level, level of dysfunction. You never know what they're going to say, or you know they're going to say something. You just don't know when. You don't know how the Thanksgiving dinner is going to end. You know what I'm saying? It's been there. And so just about every, every family that I know has a touch of dysfunction. Isaac's family had a touch of dysfunction for sure. Isaac didn't trust uh, his son Jacob, nor did he trust his wife Rebecca. And he favored Esau. Now, how many parents, I mean, I'm talking to a lot of parents out here today and online with us. And I don't want to say this, but you know what I'm talking about. Like if you had to choose one child, you know what I'm saying? And all of you would be like, no, nah, we, don't, we don't play favorites in this house. And I mean, I got to believe that, but it depends on the day. <laughs> Jacob was just straight up. Uh, Isaac, Isaac was just straight up. He favored Esau. And Rebecca favored Jacob. Rebecca, 
Isaac's wife, we see in the scriptures, was a schemer. She was a deceiver. Esau lived for himself. Jacob lived for himself. And in the midst of all of this, God preordained Jacob, preordained Jacob to get the blessing. I'm going to press in on this truth today. That God functions amiss the dysfunction. God functions amiss the dysfunctional family. Now, I said everyone has a touch of that one person, you know. And the beauty of the gospel is that God still moves amidst the dysfunction. That's good news for those that have been hurt, betrayed, lied to. And for many years, you're holding this pain. That's why when you see that person, you run the other way. Or when you know that person's coming, you don't show up. What if? God was above all of that. And through his goodness and faithfulness, he gave you the ability and strength to forgive that very person. Perhaps you've been holding on to hurt for a number of years. God functions amiss the dysfunctional family. You see in chapter 26, last week, Pastor Zach brought a strong word. We see that Isaac lied about about. Rebecca, he lied about Rebecca being his wife. He told Rebecca, hey, tell him, you're, tell him you're my sister. Well, where did he get that from? He got that from Pops. Abraham did it not just once, he did it twice. Bit of dysfunction. Chapter 25, we see that there's this, this battle that's going on, starting in the womb, Rebecca's womb, between the twins, Jacob and Esau. And we've already seen that Jacob stole Esau's birthright. And today, what we're going to see in chapter 27 is it's not just enough to steal his birthright, but to take away the blessing. He gets both. Talk about dysfunction. Now, there's 37 years that have passed from chapter 26 to where we're at in chapter 27. A whole lot of years have gone by. Between chapter 26, chapter 27. Isaac is now 137 years old. Esau and Jacob are 77 years old. Look at verse 1, Genesis chapter 27. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could not see, he called his older son Esau and said to him, my son. And he answered, here I am. He said, look, I am old and do not know the day of my death. So now take your hunting gear, your quiver and bow, and go out in the field to hunt some game for me. Then make me a delicious meal that I love and bring it to me to eat so that I can bless you before I die. We've already seen that Esau is sponsored by Bass Pro, and, and he's this, I mean, that's who this guy is. He's this. He's this good old country boy that, that, that knows how to kill stuff. You know, you, everybody knows that guy. We have several in our church, praise God. Or when, when you go out and you do that, and, and, and then you provide some of, the, uh, some of that meat. I will accept it at any moment. What we see in this opening of chapter 27, that Isaac's getting old and up in age. He knows he doesn't have much time left. And so what does he, what does he do? He, he wants to bless Esau. He wants to bless Esau, even though Esau's birthright has been stolen. Esau despised his birthright. We've seen that. But he wants to bless him before he dies. So he sends him, he sends him out. Look at verse 5. Now, Rebekah was listening to what Isaac said to his son Esau. So while I, Esau went to the field to hunt some game to bring in, Rebekah said to his son Jacob, Listen, I heard your father talking with your brother Esau. He said, bring me game and make a delicious meal for me. Eat so that I can bless you in the Lord's presence before I die. Now, my son, listen to me and do what I tell you. Go to the flock and bring me 
two choice young goats, and I will make them into a delicious meal for your father, the kind he loves. See, Rebecca knew that Jacob was not the hunter. <laughs> he was the mama's boy. And uh, but we also see that Rebecca was the schemer. We, we see that here. She's listening and she knows what's about to take place. And so she sends the one that she favors on the easy route to go slaughter these young goats. Verse nine, go to the flock and bring me two choice young goats and I will make them into a delicious meal for your father, the kind he loves. Verse 10, then take it to your father to eat so that he may, may bless you before he dies. Jacob answered Rebekah, his mother, look at my brother Esau is a hairy man, but I am a man with smooth skin. We'll just, we're going to leave that. Just leave it lie. Let it lie right there. Okay. We'll unpack that anymore. Suppose verse 12, my father touches me, then I will be revealed to him as a deceiver and bring a curse rather than a blessing on myself. Verse 13, his mother said to him, your curse be on me. My son, just obey me and go get them for me. Rebecca was this role model for her son. She's teaching her son. How many of you know, how many uh, parents know that, that, that your children are learning from you? Uh, they're, they're, they're watching you. Even when you're not instructing, they're still learning from you. They're, they're listening, just like Rebecca was listening in this moment. They're listening. So when he, verse 14, so, so he went and got the goats and brought them to his mother. And his mother made the delicious food his father loved. Then Rebecca took the best clothes of her older son, Esau, which were in the house, and had her younger son, Jacob, wear them. She put the skins of the young goats on his hands and the smooth part of his neck. Then she handed the delicious food and the bread she had made to her son, Jacob. And so what is happening here? Rebecca attempts to help God fulfill his promise. That's what we see happening here. Rebecca goes against the ways of God, falls into the Traps, the sinful traps of deceit, lies. She's scheming. I want you to hear today that God doesn't need your help to fulfill his promises. Now, that's the one thing I want you to hear. The second thing is what a privilege it is when we get to be used by God in areas that bring him glory and honor. I don't want you to miss that. But on the other side of it, Rebecca was convinced that God needed her help. And so what does she do? She does whatever it takes. And I would say, even in verse 13, as Rebecca said to Jacob, your curse be on me. My son, just obey me and go get them for me. Listen closely, church. There, there is no place in the life, in the life of of the believer for deception. There's, there's no place. And we need the church to rise up with honesty and transparency and integrity and character. There is no place where this should live among us. Your family should know that you are men and women of truth. Your coworkers should know that you are men and women of truth. And when you're put in that position, should I just lie? Oh, it's just a white lie. You ever, you ever, you ever, you ever convince yourself? I, I tell you, the enemy knows how to play this game. Man, he could get you start thinking. He, he, gets, that, he gets that mind started working. And, and the next thing you know, you have rationalized it and justified it to death. And therefore, you've given in to the temptation and you cross the line of sin. And this is what Rebecca does. And this is what she leads her son to do. Parents, your character matters. Christ follower, your character matters. You don't wait till you don't wait till you have children to start building your character. You know, your character, single folk, starts right here, right now. Your character matters. So what do we see here? We see a character versus reputation. See, Jacob is concerned in this very moment. He is concerned about what his mom is going to think, what others will think. 
rather than who he is. What he does. See, reputation is what others think you are. But character is who you are when no one is looking. And I wonder today, what does what your character look like? What does your character look like? When no one is around, the dark moments of life, what does your character look like? Look at verse 18. When he came to his father, he said, my, my father, and he answered, here I, here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob replied to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how did you ever find it so quickly, my son? I mean, he, he, he knew he was good, but not that good, right? He replied, because the Lord, look at his reply. Because the Lord, your God, made it happen for me. Then Isaac said to Jacob, please come closer so I can touch you, my son. Are you really my son Esau or, or not? So not only does he go with the plan of deceit, the deceitful plan, not only does he follow through with this deceitful plan from his, from his mama, but then he brings the Lord into it. He brings the, the Lord into this. Jacob uses the Lord to further his agenda, to further his desire to receive that, that, that blessing. He uses God's name to gain credibility in a way that's not God honoring. Why? Because it's built on a foundation of deceit. Verse 22, so Jacob came closer to his father Isaac when he touched him. Mark that. He said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau, so he blessed him. Again, he asked, are you really my son Esau? And he replied, I am. Then he said, bring it closer. Bring it closer to me. And let me eat some of my son's game so that I can bless you, Jacob brought it closer to him and he ate. He brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, please come closer and kiss me, my son. So he came closer and kissed him. When Isaac smelled, mark that, his clothes, he blessed him and said, ah, oh, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. So Jacob deceives his father with senses. So don't miss this. Jacob deceives his father with his, with his, with his senses. You see the, the touch in verse 22. His mom knew what, what his father was going to do, what Isaac was going to do. So she takes the animal skins and, and puts it on him. And then he, then he breathes in. He has that smell. He smells them. You see in verse 27, Isaac is deceived in this moment by Jacob. Notice this, though. In this very moment of deceit, the word did not fail. The word of God did not fail. His senses and feelings failed him. And you and I, we must use the living, revealed word of God for the criteria, uh, as criteria for truth and, and error, not our feelings. All too many times, we are making decisions based on feelings. I feel like I need this, so I'm going to pursue it. I feel like I want this, so I'm going to keep eating it. Whatever the feeling is. All too many times, that's how we're basing our decisions. Can I just encourage us? We cannot base our decisions on how we feel. We as the church must base our decisions on the word of God and the word of God alone. We must be men and women of the word. Michael Novick said this, there is 
No such thing as truth. They teach even the little ones. Truth is bondage. Believe what seems right to you. There are as many truths as there are individuals. Follow your feelings. Do as you please. Get in touch with yourself. Do what feels comfortable. This is the, this is the garbage. It's being spoken. Sadly, even in some places being preached. And we have got to know what the word of God declares to be truth so that we can decipher. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for this living word because there are many a days that if I just went by my feeling, I wouldn't be allowed to stand in this pulpit. There's many a days that we allow our feeling to dictate our standard. We will lose the testimony of how good God is and how mighty to save to a lost and dying world. Psalm 119 verse 160 says this. Would you write that reference down? Psalm 119, 160. The entirety of your word is truth. Each of your righteous judgment endures forever. The entirety of this word is truth. This is the only source of truth and authority for our lives. It's right here. And what an access that we have. In 2023, no matter where we find ourselves, even in the world, to read this, this word. John 16 verse 13 says, When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. We have the spirit of God living within us. Those who have professed Jesus as Savior, confessed that Jesus is Lord and believed in him for salvation. The spirit of God lives inside of you, lives inside of me to help us, guide us into all truth. Look at verse 28. This is part of his blessing. Isaac is blessing Jacob. May God give to you from the dew of the sky and from the richness of the land an abundance of grain and new wine. Verse 29, may peoples serve you and nations bow and worship to you. Be master over your relatives. May your mother's sons bow and worship to you. Those who curse you will be cursed and those who bless you will be blessed. So we see the Isaac. Blesses Jacob. And then look at verse 30. As soon as Jacob had finished blessing, uh, Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had left the presence of his father Isaac, guess who comes in? With a fresh catch. His brother Esau arrived from his hunting. He had also made some delicious food and brought it to his father. He said to his father, let my father get up and eat some of his son's game so that you may bless me. But his father, Isaac said to him, who are you? He answered, I am Esau, your firstborn son. Look what happens in verse 33. Look, look what happened. Isaac began to tremble uncontrollably, uncontrollably. Isaac began to tremble uncontrollably. Who was it then? He said, who hunted game and brought it to me. I ate it all before you came in and I blessed him. Indeed, he will be blessed. He will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he cried out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me too, my father, bless, bless me too. But he replied, your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. So he said, isn't he rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me twice now. He took my birthright and, and, and look, now he, was ta- he has taken my blessing. Then he asked, haven't you saved a blessing for, for me? Haven't you saved a blessing for me? Don't you got an extra one, dad? Verse 37, but Isaac answered Esau, look, I have made him a master over you, have given him all of his relatives as his servants and have sustained him with grain and new wine. What then can I do for you, my son? Verse 38, Esau said to his father, do you have only one blessing, my father? 
bless me too, my father. And Esau wept loudly. His father Isaac answered him, look, your dwelling place will be away from the riches of the land, away from the dew of the sky above. You will live by your sword and you will serve your brother. And when you rebel, you will break his yoke from your neck. We see in this section, the deception is revealed. We see Isaac is trembling under what, what, what he just learned of. He's trembling under conviction. The Isaac blessed the, the wrong son in his mind. But what we know today is that Isaac blessed the right son in God's plan. God functions a miss the dysfunctional family. How? How can we believe this to be true? Because God is, is sovereign over all things. In verse 41, Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. And Esau determined in his heart the days of mourning for my father are approaching. Notice this. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. What do we see here? Revenge is a miserable way to live. There's some in the house and there's some online. I, I got to believe that, that you're you're living with hurt. You've never taken that hurt to the Lord. You've never forgiven that person that harmed you. And so in one way or another, there's some kind of scheming, whether you want to or not. There's a wish on them. And, and if there's any takeaway from what we see before us is would you come to the place of true forgiveness. Some of you wonder why I can never feel free, feel alive. Because you're living in a, a prison of unforgiveness. That's why. Ephesians chapter 4. A very clear scripture to all of us. To the church. Forgive. As you have been forgiven. But Tim, you just don't know what that person did. But what we know is the example of our Savior. He went to the cross over 2,000 years ago. And he was crucified for your sins and my sins. I at one point rejected him. Turned my back on him. Sinned against him. But he still willingly went to the cross. And his blood was shed. Be forgiven so that I could them, so that I can live a life of forgiveness. We see at the closing of this chapter, we see that Rebecca encourages Jacob to flee. And, and, and here's what happens. As Rebecca encourages Jacob to flee, her plan backfires. She says, hey, just go away for a few days. And let your brother cool off. And, and what we're going to see moving forward is that Rebecca will never see her son again. A few days turns into 20 years. And perhaps there's some that have been running. You thought it should be a few days. I just kind of go over here, drift over here, do my thing over here. And I'll, get, I'll get back to the Lord when I feel like it. And, and perhaps it started with a few days and but you're here today. You're, you're today. And I got good news for you. That the Father's arms are open wide, ready to welcome you home. He's ready to embrace you and forgive you and comfort you and for you to experience hope and life in Christ Jesus. And what will you do with it? As we close, quickly, how do we build trust in a world full of deceit? I want you to think about this. Consider this. 
How do we build trust in a world full of deceit? The, the first is this. Would you write this down? Surrender to the Lordship of Jesus. How, how? How do we build trust in a world full of deceit? It starts with Jesus being Lord of your life. And I wonder how if you surrender to his Lordship. Jesus is Lord. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Have you done that? Surrender to his lordship. John 14, 6 says, Jesus told him, I, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth. How do we build trust in a world full of deceit? Surrender to the Lordship of Jesus. Why? Because he is truth. He is, he is truth. Secondly, would you write this down? Secondly, sur surround yourself with people that are honest and truthful. Surround yourself with people that are honest and, and truthful. Examine those that are around you. I examine those that are in your close circle. Examine those that are speaking into you because they're either speaking life or death. And so, so how? How do we build trust in a world full of deceit? Surrender to the Lordship of Jesus and surrender, surround yourself. Surround yourself with honest, truthful people. Proverbs 10, 9 says, The one who lives with integrity lives securely, but whoever perverts his ways will be found out. Proverbs 13, 20 says, The one who walks with the wise will become wise, but a companion of fools will suffer are. So how? How do we build trust in a world full of deceit? Have you surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus? And would you take a moment and consider the people that are closest to you? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place? Those that are worshiping with us online, would you do the same? We're not finished yet. This is an opportunity for you to get one-on-one -on -one with creator God and just simply say, what is my response? What is my response to all of this? God, what needs to change in me, in my life, around me? What, what needs to change? Would you just simply say, Lord, what is my response? As believers are praying that all across this place, I wonder if there's someone here that's never surrendered their life over to Jesus. And today could be the day of salvation for you. Today could be the day of salvation. If that's you, something's stirring within you. You're not sure if you were to die today where you would spend eternity. I want you to know on the authority of Scripture, there can be a confidence not in you or in, in your good works, but in Jesus and his finished works. And so if that's you, something's stirring in you, whether you're in the house or your own line, would you take a moment and would you pray something like this? Something like this. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. You are the Savior. Forgive me of all my sins and take me to heaven when I die. I believe in you. You walked this earth. You died on a cross. You were placed in a grave and you rose. You rose from the grave, I believe. Starting this day, this moment, right now, I surrender completely over to you. Have your way in my life. Use me for your glory. Thank you for saving me. If that's your prayer, would you thank him right where you're at? Whether in the house or online, would you thank him for saving you?